Today on the Perception in Action podcast, how effective is neurofeedback training for improving sports performance? Which brain rhythm should we be targeting for the best results? Is it worth the investment of time and money? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to start a two-part series looking at what we might call neurotraining for sports. Next week, I'll review evidence for the effectiveness of brain stimulation. Well, today I want to look at neurofeedback. My goals here are to summarize where we stand and where we need to go research-wise with these technologies and techniques, and give some practical advice about whether or not it's worth investing your time and money into these things. Neural feedback is a type of biofeedback in which a person's brain activity is transformed into an external signal that is fed back to them in some manner so that they can learn to change and influence this activity. The feedback is typically auditory, visual, or some combination of the two. It can be based on a variety of different signals, including blood flow and oxygen consumption, but by far the most common method involves feeding back electrical activity from the brain recorded using electroencephalography, or EEG. EEG is typically recorded from the scalp and gives a measure of the overall brain activity produced by synaptic transmissions. If you've ever seen it before, an EEG signal is like a wave of electrical activity, and can be quantified in terms of its timing, amplitude, and frequency. EEG signals are typically analyzed in the frequency domain and are commonly divided into five major frequency bands expressed in cycles, or the number of times a wave goes up and down, per second. The lowest frequency band, delta, ranges from 0.5 to 4 hertz. It has been shown to be dominant in sleep and in memory consolidation. The next band, which is one that we'll see has been studied a lot in sports, is called theta, and it ranges from 4 to 8 hertz. Theta seems to be related to encoding and processing information and in memory retrieval. Alpha, which ranges from 8 to 12 hertz, is another band that has been linked to sports performance because it's related to the level of arousal and conscious attention devoted to a task. The fourth band is again another one that has been linked to sports, the sensory motor rhythm or SMR, which ranges from 12 to 15 hertz. It has been shown to be related to anxiety and motor activity among other things. The final two bands are beta, 15 to 30 hertz, which has been linked to conscious problem solving, and gamma, anything above 30 hertz, which again seems to be linked to highly cognitive tasks. What is the potential link between these EEG signals and sports performance that has inspired training interventions? Well, there's been quite a lot of evidence showing that the brain activity in some of these different bands differs between athletes at different skill levels. A general model of this can be seen in the psychomotor efficiency theory, which I discussed back in episode 101. As a couple specific examples, in 2017, Cheng found that the best air pistol shooting performance was preceded by higher sensory motor rhythm, or SMR, power during the last second before action initiation, whereas worse performance was preceded by reduced SMR power. Another good example comes from the work of Andy Cook and Chris Ring, who I'll talk more about later. In a 2014 study, they compared EEG activity preceding hold versus missed putts in both experts and novice. The results show that the expert golfers displayed a greater reduction in high alpha power, which is in the range from 10 to 12 hertz, than novices, and that hold putts were characterized by less high alpha power than missed putts in the two seconds preceding movement. So, we can see the logic of neurofeedback training for sports here. If we can identify brain activity that is associated with superior sports performance, whether it's a higher SMR or a lower high alpha activity, it may be possible to essentially cheat practice by training an athlete to reproduce the same brain activity through neurofeedback. Neurofeedback training for non-sports purposes dates back to the 1960s, where it was shown that people can learn to alter their brain activity in the alpha range. So, the key questions we want to ask today are, first, can athletes learn to regulate the brain activity that has been shown to be related to skilled performance through neurofeedback training? For example, 
can a novice golfer learn to lower their high alpha activity the seconds before they initiate a putt? And second, and more importantly, will this change in brain activity actually result in better performance outcomes? Before I dive into the reviews that have been done in this area, I want to look specifically at a couple of the better studies that have been done on neurofeedback training for sports. The seminal study in this area was conducted by Landers and colleagues in 1991. They compared two groups of novice archers, one that was trained to try and reduce the amount of cortical activity on the verbal analytic left side of the brain, which remember according to psychomotor efficiency theory is less in experts, and one group that was trained to reduce the activity in the visual spatial right side of their brain, which is typically highly active in experts. A visual feedback display showing the activity in these two areas was used for both groups. What was found? Archery performance increased from pre to post training in the first group and decreased from pre to post training in the second group, so in support of neurofeedback training. But there was a complication. When they actually compared the brain activity of the two groups in the post-tests, there was actually no difference between them in terms of the brain activity on the two sides. It was also the case that the feedback training was not given while the participants were actually doing their sport. They were just sitting at a table passively watching the display. The second study I wanted to mention was published by Ring and colleagues in 2015. Following up on their work related to made and missed putts that I mentioned a few moments ago, Golfers in this study were provided with neurofeedback about high alpha power. This study involved comparing two training groups, one that received neurofeedback training which involved being presented with an auditory tone that's pitch varied as a function of alpha activity. When the alpha activity reached the level typically shown by experts, the tone was shut off. So the golfers in this group were trained to wait until the tone went off before they started their putting stroke. Golfers in the control group followed the same procedure, except that the tone was not actually linked to their brain activity, it was just a recording. What was found? First, the neurofeedback training did seem to be successful in terms of EEG power, as golfers in the training group showed the quote-unquote expert pattern of brain activity. That is, their high alpha level had a dramatic drop-off just before they putted. The control group did not show this. But... Unfortunately, despite this change in brain activity, there were no differences in putting performance for the two groups during acquisition, retention, or in a high-pressure transfer condition. To foreshadow, this lack of clear evidence in support of neurofeedback training is really indicative of the entire field. In 2017, Mirafar and colleagues conducted a systematic review of neurofeedback training for sport. They were able to identify a total of 14 studies that were categorized based on a variety of factors including the type of feedback used, the EEG band targeted in the training, and the study design, for example whether or not there was a control group. In terms of the brain rhythm used in training, 6 of the 14 studies focused on increasing SMR power prior to movement execution, 4 targeted the beta band, and 4 targeted the alpha rhythm. In total, 12 of the 14 studies reported positive effects of the neurofeedback training on sports performance. For example, increasing SMR power has been shown to increase performance in both rifle shooting and golf putting. So, it sounds like neurofeedback training works, right? Well, as the authors of this review do a good job documenting, there are several issues with the design of the majority of the studies in this area that make it hard to draw any clear conclusions. First, in many of the studies, the rationale for the frequency band targeted is not clear. And in fact, in separate studies, it's been found that increasing and decreasing the same band, in particular theta, can both result in improved sports performance. When doing the exact opposite manipulation leads to the same results, it suggests that it's not really the manipulation that is having an effect, but rather something else like a placebo effect. In their analyses, Mirafar and colleagues determined that only 4 out of the 14 studies had a clear theoretical rationale for the EEG band they were targeting in training. The second major issue, you probably already guessed, is related to the experimental designs used. Of the 14 studies, the majority used small sample sizes and were underpowered. Of the 14, only 4 included some kind of placebo group to compare the neurofeedback training to, and the majority of these were passive placebo groups, an issue I'll talk more about in a second. A final methodological issue concerns the length of the training. Many of the studies use a single session of training that produce only transient effects on performance that were not retained at all. So when all these factors are taken into account, 
the evidence in support of neurofeedback training for sport is pretty weak. A very similar conclusion was reached in a meta-analysis conducted by Zhang and colleagues earlier this year. They conducted a search for studies that used a randomized control trial approach and were able to find a total of 10, involving 229 athletes. Overall, there were significant effects found for both changes in the EEG power after training and changes in sports performance. However, here is where the passive and active placebo issue comes in. A passive placebo study involves comparing some type of training group to a group that receives no training at all. In an active placebo study, you use a comparison group that receives some type of training that is not expected to have any effect on performance. A great example of this is the study by Ring and Cook I just talked about earlier, where the placebo group went through the identical training to the experimental group, except the feedback was not actually linked to their brain activity. The problem with using a passive, no-training placebo group instead of an active placebo control is that it leaves open multiple alternative explanations for any performance effects observed. If you bring an athlete into the lab and have them perform some type of novel training involving lots of fancy equipment and tell them that it will improve their sports performance, it's very likely they will be more motivated, attentive, and confident. All things we know help performance. A passive placebo group is not likely to experience any of these benefits. And this was borne out in the Zhang and colleagues analysis. When only studies which used an active placebo control group were considered, there were no longer any significant effects of neurofeedback training on sports performance. The final study I wanted to mention today was an interesting one published earlier this year that looked at the question of when neurofeedback training should be used. It has been shown that different EEG bands correspond to aspects of performance before, during, and after training, corresponding to preparation, encoding, and consolidation, for example. Which one of these is the best to target in practice? In a study published earlier this year, Jashmian and colleagues compared neurofeedback training to reduce the amplitude of what is called the mu rhythm in the motor cortex immediately before practice. The alternative training was designed to increase the theta rhythm immediately after practice. The task used in this experiment was a pursuit tracking task, which involves following a moving target presented on a computer display with a stylus. 42 volunteers were split into pre- or post-neurofeedback training groups. A visual display of the EEG signal was used in the training. What was found? As is the case with most neurofeedback training studies, the training produced the desired changes in the EEG activity. The pre-group reduced their mu band, while the post-group increased their theta band. But what about performance? At a retention test given 90 minutes after training, the theta band training group had significantly better performance. However, performance differences disappeared after 24 hours. So while there is some evidence that neurofeedback training focused on consolidation of motor learning may be the most effective, the results did not seem to be long lasting. And of course, the lack of a placebo control group makes it hard to interpret these effects. To sum up, Although there seems to be some potential for the use of neurofeedback training in sports, the evidence in support of it is very weak due to poor experimental design. Personally, I'm also a bit skeptical of the basic logic of it all. The neural activity we observe in experts comes from hours and hours of practice with solving movement problems in sports. If we just superficially reproduce this brain activity in a novice, without all the associated processes and exploration that was required to achieve it, Will we really get expert performance in the end? And even if this did work under basic conditions, my hunch is that any performance gains achieved through neurofeedback training would fall apart under changing conditions because the performer would have no way of learning how to adapt their behavior and the associated neural activity to changes in the constraints. So, in a nutshell, while I'm interested to see where this area goes research-wise, I don't think neurofeedback training is ready for prime time yet and is not worth the time investment involved in my opinion. As I mentioned, next time I will turn to another type of neural training for sport, brain stimulation. Will it fare any better? We will see. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials including transcripts and an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com 
forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah, yeah,